In this video, we are going to discuss the subacute workup of stroke and then just some quick stroke facts. Um, I did a separate video about acute stroke, so if you haven't watched that, definitely look that up first. But so after a patient comes in and they've had an acute stroke, you've either given TPA or aspirin, and then you've evaluated them whether they need a thrombectomy or not, um, you start the subacute workup. So this typically is about 24 hours after they present to the hospital, after you've already stabilized them and um, they're on the neuro service. And so... There's a multitude of labs, imaging, medications that you'll basically do for most of your patients who come in with stroke. So you can kind of just um, see these as relatively routine regardless of why they're coming in. So the most common stroke causes are just thrombosis from a large vessel. Um, you can also have small infarcts in the lacuna region. You can also have embolism typically coming from the heart, such as AFib from prosthetic valves, endocarditis, um, and acute MI where the flow is stopped uh, briefly can also give you an emboli. And then a lot of strokes still fall under the category of cryptogenic or unknown source, basically. And so um, there's a multitude of different etiologies, and sometimes you just can't figure out exactly why someone had a stroke. So the first thing you want to start with is labs that you'll draw on the patient. Um, you want to check their lipids, their A1C, TSH and a free T4, a urine drug screen, and then also CBC with platelet count. The reason that all of these are significant is because it will help you basically um, separate out any sort of etiology. So whether they have hyperlipidemia and puts them at a hypercoagulable state, um, same thing with urine drug screen, different sort of drugs can cause strokes, um, increase or decrease platelet count can cause either ischemic or hemorrhagic strokes. And so you want to check all those labs first because those can definitely give you a clue of why this happens. Um, imaging wise, we already talked about how you're going to get a non-con CT right when they walk into the hospital to determine bleed or no bleed. And then other imaging you're going to want to get then is EKG is really helpful because it can show you if a patient has AFib or maybe they had a like subacute MI or some other reason why um, a cardiac reason could be the source of their stroke. So I always get an EKG. Also get a TTE or TEE with a bubble study. This will show you if a patient has a patent foramen ovale for which strokes are more common and um, that is definitely a source of uh, cardioembolic strokes. And then typically you'll get an MRI and or an MRA, so an angiography and just MR imaging. Um, this will show you more precisely where the stroke has affected. So the CT is helpful for seeing bleeds, but for seeing the actual tissues of the brain, MRI is much better study for that. And um, it can help connect some of the symptoms that the patient's having with the imaging and kind of um, further work up from there and seeing what is affected. Often you can get a carotid ultrasound or duplex as well to see the patency of the carotid arteries. Like I said, that could be a source of large vessel occlusion for some patients. And so just making sure that we are always checking the carotids um, is important just because it's not in the brain, what we would typically think of, but of course it's those vessels leading straight to the brain so they can absolutely cause strokes. Um, medications we also touched on a little bit, but right when a patient comes in, if they're given TPA, you don't want to load them with aspirin 325, but otherwise you give them aspirin 325, um, as a one-time loading dose, and then you continue aspirin 81 or a baby aspirin then after that. Um, Plavix is also given as a one-time loading dose of 300 milligrams followed by 75 milligrams daily. And if you've ever heard of DAPT or dual antiplatelet therapy, um, a lot of times this is what they're referring to. So the combination of aspirin and Plavix has shown to significantly reduce patients' risk of recurrent stroke. Uh, depending on what study you look at, the dual therapy can be... Um, given anywhere from 21 to 90 days. And that kind of depends on the patient. 
After the 90 days though, it is not um, recommended to have patients on dual antiplatelet therapy. So if you do see them say anytime after three months after their stroke and they still happen to be on both of these, make sure that they are um, following up with someone specifically pharmacy or neurology or someone about managing those medications because the risks of repeat bleed do outweigh um, the risks of benefit after 90 days. And other medications you should start is a statin, so a torvastatin, rosuvastatin. Um, if they're already on one and it's low dose, you want to increase them to high dose statin. And if they aren't one, if they aren't on a statin at all, you can just start statin at normal or high dose. Um, it has been shown that ACE inhibitors, even just a small um, dose like 2.5 or 5 milligrams, um, has shown a decreased mortality after a stroke for patients. And so as long as their blood pressure can tolerate that, um, that's definitely a medication you should think about starting. And weirdly enough, um, fluoxetine is a medication that has, if you start it within five to 10 days, it's been shown to increase patient's motor recovery after stroke. So that's something that you should always be thinking about. And, you know, there's a slew of other reasons why maybe you wouldn't want to start them on SSRI, say if they already have on one or if they're already on different serotonin medications. But think about that specifically if they have motor deficits, because that can increase their motor recovery when started five to 10 days after their stroke. Um, another thing that's going to be really important for patients with stroke is just making sure that they're seeing the right people and getting them set up successfully for going home. So PTOT should see the patient just the next day, see what kind of deficits they have in um, their processing of their brain and then also just movement. So PTOT can help with that. Another less um, well-known side effect of a stroke is many, many patients after stroke have um, silent aspiration, and this increasingly um, increases their risk for aspiration pneumonia, or it can even cause cardiac arrest, other uh, or respiratory arrest, other really big problems. So make sure that you have speech evaluate them and preferably keep them NPO until speech is able to evaluate them. So you definitely want a formal speech consult over just a bedside swallow because a lot of times if you're just using um, bedside swallow eval, you're missing that silent aspiration piece. So they should always get PT, OT, and speech evaluated. And then oftentimes these patients can't go straight from the acute hospital home just because they have had a change in their motor function or they can't process things as good as they could before. And so they need a little bit more of these intensive therapies. This is where discharge to a rehab hospital um, is usually very helpful for these patients and can get them really intense therapy really quickly. So that's the basis of the subacute workup. Really quickly, I'm just going to go over some other pearls um, having to do with stroke. So in the first 24 to 48 hours, um, patients typically are hypertensive. The reason this happens is because the brain is trying to increase blood pressure so that these spots that are ischemic um, can get more blood to those areas. So it increases the blood pressure to the whole body. This is good to a certain point, but if it goes beyond um, the safe level of increased blood pressure, then it starts increasing your risk for hemorrhagic conversion. And so there's a couple guidelines we follow for permissive hypertension. So like I said, this is 24 to 48 hours. You want to let them be hypertensive, but only to a certain extent. So if they did get TPA, you want to keep their goal blood pressure 180, excuse me, 180 over 105. You want to keep it under that because they do have an increased risk of converting to a hemorrhagic stroke. And so um, if you give TPA, it's a little more stringent. Otherwise, if you don't give TPA, you just want to keep them anywhere under... 220 over 120. And this seems like 
very high. It is normally in patients very high, but this short time after a stroke, it's actually okay to have those high blood pressures because it's a more of a defense mechanism to try to um, get as much blood to the brain as possible. And so those you can allow. Um, and then just some quick facts for boards that I definitely saw on my boards are um, they like to ask about risk factors for stroke. And so the most important modifiable risk factor, so something that you can do something about, you can change, is hypertension. They are definitely going to put smoking on um, there as an answer choice. Although smoking does significantly increase your risk, high blood pressure is the one that has shown to be the most important um, for stroke risk. And then a non-modifiable risk factor would be age. So as you get older, um, there's nothing we can do about it. Just your risk of having a stroke is higher. And this last piece, it's helpful for your patients, not necessarily something you'll see on boards, but a lot of times after people come in with strokes, they ask, um, what does the recovery look like? How long am I going to be like this? Whether it's the patient or the family asking that. And so it's just helpful to know that most recovery um, is seen within six months and then the first three months being the most important. And so this is another reason why getting a patient into an intensive rehab, inpatient or outpatient, right after their stroke is important because the most recovery they can make in that first three to six months um, really shows how much they're going to recover from this stroke. Not that um, they can't recover beyond six months, but typically most of the recovery is seen by six months. And so the, most, the more that they can get out of therapy and the more strength and things that they can um, get back in that amount of time is the best prognostic factor. So just really quick review, um, you want to get labs that will help you differentiate why this stroke happened, and then also imaging with that EKG, TTE, MRI, carotid ultrasound. You want to make sure you put, put them on antiplatelet therapy. Um, aspirin and Plavix are the most common with their loading doses and then maintenance no doses for 21 to 90 days. You want to make sure they're on a statin. Consider them putting them on an ACE inhibitor for decrease in mortality. Uh, fluoxetine can help with motor recovery. And then make sure you get those consults in, specifically PT, OT, speech. And then um, remember just that their blood pressure is going to be high after a stroke, and that's okay as long as they're below these goals. And if they are above 180 or 220, respectively, for TPA or no TPA, um, at that point, Point, you want to start using some IV medications like labetalol or um, some other IV medication to keep that, their blood pressure below that. And then make sure you know that hypertension is the most important modifiable risk factor. Age is the most important non-modifiable risk factor. And typically the best um, recovery is seen in the first three to six months.